Good evening, everyone. Well, last Teen Connections at Chandler Road, I was sitting down and Barrett walks up to me and I guess, as he said, he voluntold me that I'll be teaching tonight. So I begin to think, what should my lesson be? So I came up with the contents of a dead man's pockets. Pretty interesting title, right? Well, it's great because I just made it up because I thought it would get you guys here. It has nothing to do with the lesson. I'm, I'm kidding. It actually is titled Contents of a Dead Man's Pockets, and this is actually a drawing my sister did when she read this story. So, how many of you have actually read this short story? Okay, we have a couple. So, I'm going to give a summary of it so you'll be able to understand this lesson. So, the story opens in New York in the 11th story of apartment of Tom Beneke for another night he's at his desk at a typewriter working after hours overtime on a project and his, his wife Claire is introduced she's about to go to the theater and Tom once again isn't he's not going with her now on Tom's desk there's a lot of papers whole lot of papers, but one specific paper is very, very important to Tom. It's a single yellow sheet of paper. Now, on this paper is months and months of research. Tom works for marketing for a grocery store, and he has months and months of work on a display that's going to get him a promotion, that's going to make him the boy wizard of wholesale groceries. So, Claire walks out the door. She goes to the theater, and as she walks out the door, a draft blows through, moving the papers on Tom's desk. Now, as the draft blows through, the yellow sheet of paper flies out the open window. Tom rushes in a panic. He goes and he looks out the window, and he sees that the paper has landed on a ledge, right between the two buildings on a corner. And he starts panicking. He starts looking around the apartment. He tries to find something that's long enough to get the piece of paper, and he can't find anything. And then this crazy idea hits him. He looks out, and he thinks, what if I went out on the ledge? And he starts to rationalize. It'll be simple. I'll be out for two minutes. I could get, it, get out there, grab the paper, and be back. So he decides that's what he'll do. So he puts one leg over the windowsill, puts the other leg over, and turns around, facing the wall. And he grips the bricks, and he moves inch by inch, and he finally reaches the piece of paper. So when he looks at the piece of paper, he realizes he's going to have to put one foot on one end of the corner, one foot on the other end, and bend down. So he puts one foot over, begins squatting, and it lets his head scrape against the corner. And he grabs the paper, but as he's grabbing the paper, he looks down at the street below, and he begins to panic. Panic and just takes over. He sits there, and his fear causes him to jerk upright. He hits his head on the wall and almost falls over. He sits there for what feels like hours, gripping at the bricks, every fiber of his being telling him not to fall, not to pass out. So then he decides he has to move after what feels like hours to him. So, inch... By excruciating inch, he slowly starts moving, and then he trips. His right foot smashes into his left ankle, and he goes tumbling. But then, reaching for something, he grabs the window and closes it. Tom Beneke realizes that he is now outside, on the 11th story, on a ledge the width of his foot, and the window just closed. So, he starts thinking. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It's going to be, I got to do something. And he remembers Claire. 
Claire will be back. Everything's going to be fine. When she comes in, she'll open the window, and then he remembers Claire can open the window by herself. And then he thinks, no, 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 I can't think like that. She'll get a neighbor. And then when I come in, I'll be ready to answer all of their crazy questions about how I got out there. And then he looks in the window. And he notices a lit cigarette with smoke still trailing off of it. He's been on the ledge for two minutes. Claire won't be back for another four hours. He realizes he has to do something now. So he tries to break the window. So he takes a coin out of his pocket and he hits it against the window, not a scratch. He takes off one of his shoes, hits the window, not a single crack. So he starts thinking, what's, this, what's another idea? What's something else he can do? He starts digging in his pockets. He finds some pieces of paper and he looks across, he says, finds a lighter. He starts burning the piece of paper, trying to get the neighbors to notice on the other side of the street, see if they'll notice there's a man up there and no one does. He keeps digging in his pockets. He finds some coins and he starts dropping about three at a time, trying to get someone to notice him, someone to look up, but no one notices. He fu he's furiously digging in his pockets and he finds the last thing in his pockets is this yellow sheet of paper. He looks at it and he thinks, if I fall off this ledge, this is going to be all that's on me. So no one will be able to identify the body for a while and all they'll know about me is this yellow sheet of paper with a bunch of scribbles on it that no one can even read. Wouldn't mean anything. The contents of a dead man's pockets. Then he starts thinking of Claire, about all the time he's wasted on this paper, all the time he's not spent with her, and he starts thinking again, the contents of a dead man's pockets. A wasted life. He finally decides he has to do something now. He can't wait. No one's noticing. He has to do something. So he decides he's going to break through that window. So he looks in the window, looks at his warm apartment that he left for this piece of paper, and he puts his hand in a fist, leans back as far as he can without falling over, and with a shout of his wife's name, Claire, punches the window and breaks directly through it. He rolls into his apartment. And without even thinking, jumps up, runs to grab his coat and hat to go find Claire at the theater. But as he opens the door, a draft blows through. And the yellow sheet of paper he set on his desk goes blowing out the glassless window. Tom looks, laughs, and walks out. And that's the end of the story. But I think there's five lessons that we can learn for ourselves from Tom. The first of these being our priorities can be misplaced. So this is one of the more important parts of this because it's what gets him out on the ledge in the first place. So throughout this lesson, I'm going to be taking what Tom did or didn't do. And I'll be applying it to us spiritually. So Tom, he was working extra hours, not on a project which was due. In the story, it says it was not actually true that he had to work tonight, though he very much wanted to. This was his own project, unannounced as yet in his office, and it could be postponed. Also, he focused on advancement. He wanted to be the boy wizard of wholesale groceries, and he wanted to be, get a promotion. That's what he wanted, what would help him. And he chose work over spending time with Claire. Now, how does this apply to us, spiritually? Well, the bottom line of all of these is selfishness. So, with us, it can be activities, technology, anything like that. Things that'll satisfy us. What makes me feel good? Doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks. And we set ourselves over meaningful relationships. Now, in the Bible, there's a couple examples of this. The first one is the rich man in Luke 12, 16 through 21. Now, the rich man, he's very prosperous, has a lot of barns, and he decides, I'm going to tear down those barns, and I'm going to build bigger barns, because I'm important, and that's what's going to make me happy. But this is what God has to say about that. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Another example would be Martha 
in Luke 10, 38 through 42. Martha, in this story, Mary and Martha, they have Jesus over at their house. And Martha is so obsessed with getting everything right, making the house look perfect, and Mary is just sitting at Jesus' feet while he talks. So, and Martha asks Jesus, but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Martha found herself trying to serve the man, but not trying to serve the Messiah. A final example of someone with misplaced priorities would be Solomon in Ecclesiastes. And most of us know Solomon's great experiment, where he tried to live life without God. He was going to find something that made him happy without God. So in Ecclesiastes 2, 22 through 23, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Solomon searched. He searched for anything under the sun. And all of those priorities that even we can have that are under the sun, as he says, are all vanity. So what can we do about these misplaced priorities? There's several verses that describe what we can do. Jesus' instruction in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Paul's advice in Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And finally, James' reminder in James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So what's the bottom line of all of these? What's the most important thing? Keep looking up to him. Each of these verses tell, tell us to fix our priorities, we need to look to God. So the second lesson that can be learned from this short story, if I can get the clicker to work, <laughs> is don't look down. Because looking down brings fear. Tom looked down, we find out. At the same instant he saw between his legs and far below, Lexington Avenue stretched out for miles ahead. And a violent, instantaneous explosion of absolute terror roared through him. For the motionless instant he saw himself externally bent practically double, balanced on this narrow ledge, nearly half his body projecting out above the street far below. And he began to tremble violently, panic flaring through his mind and muscles. And he felt the blood rush from the surface of his skin. Fear took control of Tom when he looked down. Oh, went a little too far. <laughs> a fragment of his mind raised his body in a spasmodic jerk to an upright position again, but so violently that his head scraped hard against the wall, bouncing off it, and his body swayed outward to the knife edge of balance, and he very, near, very nearly plunged backward and fell. So, don't look down. There are times in life when we are going to be on the ledge. I don't know what the ledge would be for you. There's many ways that things can be a ledge in our life. But in these moments, we need to avoid looking down because fear can paralyze and fear can cause us to fall. And never forget, this is the most important thing is never forget that even on the ledge, in the dark, 11 stories off the ground, you are not alone. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Psalm 139, 7 through 9. So what do we need to do if we're on the ledge? We need to focus on him to get
get off the ledge. In Hebrews 12, it says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, there's an example of a character in the Bible who looked down. It would be Peter, in Matthew 14, 22 through 32. He took his eyes off Jesus. Now, in this story, the apostles are on a boat. And it's during a storm, and suddenly they see a figure walking towards them. And Peter says, it's Jesus. And then he realized, he said, if it is Jesus, I can walk on the water like him. So he gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. He looks down, he realizes he is standing on the water. And then he looks around and sees the wind and the waves and panics. He looks down. Fear takes control and he sinks. So he's a perfect example of someone who took their eyes off Jesus. So the third lesson would be hope is a powerful motivator. Tom focused on making it inside. At the back of his mind, there still lay the thought that once, once he was again in his home, he could give release to his feelings. He actually would lie on the floor, rolling, clenching tufts of the rug in his hands. He would literally run across the room, free to move as he liked, jumping on the floor, testing and reveling in its absolute security, letting the relief flood through him, draining the fear from his mind and body. Tom focused when he was afraid, when he was lost out there, not knowing what to do, he focused on inside, where he was safe, the place he had just left for a yellow piece of paper. He looks back and he sees everything he took for granted. And he thinks how it would just drain the fear from his mind and body. And he had hope that he would be back there. Tom focused on what was important. He thought of Claire. Just a wordless, yearning thought. And then drew his arm back just a bit more, fists so tight his fingers pained him, and knowing he was going to do it. Then with full power, with every last scrap of strength he could bring to bear, he shot his arm forward toward the glass and he said, Claire. So, why is hope so important? Why is hope such a powerful motivator? Hope's a very powerful motivator when it's all you have. In the case of Job, it's all he had. In Job eleven eighteen, you will be secure because there is hope. You will look about you and take your rest in safety. If you know the story of Job, Job lost everything. His family, his home, his health, everything. But what did he have left? Those words meant a lot to Job because all he had left was hope. God's promise is our hope when we're on that ledge. Whatever that ledge is for us, God's promise is the hope that we can get out of it. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, this verse is usually used to talk about love. But you notice in this verse, right next to love, right next to the greatest of those, is hope. God stresses the importance on hope in this verse. Now, I really like how this is worded. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he was a 19th century English preacher. He says, faith goes up the stairs that love has built and looks out the windows which hope has opened. Now, the fourth lesson we can learn is to learn from your mistakes. Because mistake is the best teacher. Tom learned. As he saw the yellow paper, the pencil flying, scooped off the desk and unimpeded by the glassless window, sail out into the night and out of his life, Tom Binnicky burst into laughter and then closed the door behind him. Instead of going back out on that ledge, instead of going to get the piece of paper, he learned. He learned what was truly important and that he didn't need that piece of paper. So at some point, we may misplace our priorities and end up on the ledge. It's probably going to happen. 
But with hope and God's help, we are going to make it back inside the apartment. But the true tragedy would be to make the same mistake again. Now in this story, if Tom would have walked right back out the window and got on the ledge in that perilous situation and where he almost died last time and go to get that piece of paper again, we would think he was crazy. We would think that's ridiculous. But sometimes we do the same thing. Right after we get out of something, sometimes we'll just turn right back to that ledge and walk right back out to it because of our priorities. So, there's some characters in the Bible who learned. They learned from their mistakes. Peter is a great example of someone who learned from their mistakes. In Luke 22 and John 18, Jesus is on trial. And while he's on trial in front of the Sanhedrin, Peter's sitting outside watching from afar. People begin to notice him and say, hey, didn't you follow him, the one on trial? Weren't you one of his apostles? And he says, no, 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 that wasn't me. And he does this three times. And then he realizes, as Jesus told him, that he just denied him three times. So, and he feels horrible about it. And he learns from his mistakes. He becomes a bold preacher of the gospel, gives the first pen the gospel speech at Pentecost. And he stands up to the Jewish rulers and said, you can kill us. And we will not stop talking about Jesus. Another person who learned was the prodigal son in Luke 15, 11 through 32. In the story of the prodigal son, he goes to his father, tells him, I want my inheritance. You're not even gone yet, but I want all the money that you owe me. Basically what he says to him. And he takes all that money, goes to a foreign country, and wastes all of it. Ends up in a pig pen eating the slop that the pigs are eating. And he learns. He realizes his mistakes and he learns and it gets him out of that pig pen. He goes back to his father, expecting nothing, but his father takes him up with his arms and loves him just like he did. Now, what's important about us learning, why we need to learn from our mistakes is because it can get us out of the pig pen. It can get us off that ledge. And even when we get back, God will accept us with open arms. Now, the fifth point is not only just a point, but also a question and a challenge. What are the contents of your pocket? In Tom's case, it occurred to him, irrelevantly, that his death on the sidewalk would be an eternal mystery. The window closed. Why, how, and from where could he have fallen? No one would be able to identify his body for a time. Either the thought was somehow unbearable and increased his fear. All they'd find in his pockets would be the yellow sheet. Contents of the dead man's pockets, he thought. One sheet of paper bearing penciled notations. Incomprehensible. He thought of all the evenings he had spent away from her, thinking of Claire in the situation, working, and he regretted them. He thought wonderingly of his fierce ambition of the direction his life had taken. He thought of the hours he'd spent by himself, filling the yellow sheet that had brought him out here. Contents of the dead man's pockets, he thought with sudden fierce anger, a wasted life. Now, what's in your pocket? Now, literally, I assume all of you have a phone in your pocket. Or at least I hope it's in your pocket and I'm not so boring you've been on it this whole time. But what would your phone say about you? If somebody opened your phone and just saw your lock screen, what would it say about you? And the horrible thought of what does your phone say about you if somebody could get into it completely, has full access. What would your phone say about you? What would they know? What, who would you be to them? Now, in a figurative sense, what is your focus? What's important to you? What's that priority? And what is your legacy? And I know that that probably sounds like a more for the people in the back kind of question, but think about it. Think about it. Right now, you're making your legacy. Every single person here right now is making their legacy. You're, everything you do, people are watching. 
So what is your legacy? At the end of the day, what is most important to you? Is it a sport you play? Is it an activity you're in? What is it? Or is it Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith? So, the contents of the dead man's pocket. What can we learn? First, our priorities can be misplaced. Second, don't look down. Third, hope is a powerful motivator. Fourth, learn from your mistakes. And fifth, is my challenge to you. What's in your pocket? Because sometimes in that misplaced priority, find yourself with a yellow sheet of paper. And this is everything about you. This is your life's work, you feel like. And if you realize it's one of those misplaced priorities, it's one of those things that's in the way of God, sometimes you just need to let the wind take it and let it go. And focus on God. Thank you.